We'll kick things off with Oxford United. Justin Peach, they currently sit 16th in the championship table. Justin, higher or lower? I've gone lower. I've also gone lower. And the reason for that is because I'm very worried about Oxford. I think the aim for them was always just to stay up the season, despite having a good start. I think it was always that. And the way they've been playing recently, I think Oxford fans would rip your hand off for safety. <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, it is it is a, a, a very competitive down sort of 15th and below because you've got Sheffield Wednesday sitting 15th on 18 points and Cardiff are in 22nd on 15 points. So, you know, three points separating a lot of teams there. And, um, and, you know, Oxford find themselves in and amongst that. So I think, you know, with Oxford going into this season, it's a case of, you know, let's try and be as competitive we can, uh, as we can and try and stay up. And, and, you know, that's completely fair considering their budget you know, how they came up as well, the disruption they had last season with Liam Manning going, Des Booking coming in, etc. Um and as well as that going into this season, they have had to deal with quite a few injuries to several key players. So I think them just trying to stay up is is a good enough uh, or a fair enough objective, I should say. Yeah. We have got to remember it is pretty remarkable that Oxford are in this position in the first place. And that sounds incredibly patronizing when I say it out loud, but it is true. Um and I think there's every chance that come the end of the season, we may turn around and say it's quite remarkable that they started so well because four wins from seven might end up being their best run of form of the season, Justin, because they have been so, so poor recently. And when a team with limited resources starts playing like this, then you begin to fear the worst. <laughs> but you're right, they are missing multiple players through injury, especially Cameron Brannigan, their best player, he should be back within the next month and they desperately need him back in top form and fully fit. The goals have dried up for Mark Harris and he looks really low on confidence now. Dane Scarlett's been scoring a few recently, but they need more goals from elsewhere too. So yeah, they've been pretty poor at the back recently as well. And if it wasn't for Jamie coming in goal, who's possibly been their best player of the season so far, they would have taken a few batterings along the way, but they're, they're also very reliant on their results at home because they've won just two points away all season and they've only won one of their last five home games. So, yeah, not a whole lot of positives to find in Oxford's last 10 games, really. And if they get back to their form from early in the season, then they may very well stay up and maybe even do it quite comfortably. But if not, it's looking a bit bleak, isn't it, Justin? No, it is and it isn't. Because when you mention you know, Cameron Brown coming back, that's a big that's a big factor in Oxford. Um, you know, he's, he's a midfielder that can change games. You've got Sariki Dembele, who I think is, you know, he's, he's picked up a couple of knocks, but also if he gets back fit and firing, he can be a very useful player at this level. Premise or Playetta as well is another one who's been unable to get going in an Oxford shirt and that's just a couple of attackers that can come in and support um you know what is a an attack that has dried up. So I think there is yeah maybe not a positives but certainly room for optimism for Oxford to grow because they had a very busy summer and we've not seen a lot of those players really prosper. Louis Sibley is another one. Um so yeah I think you know it's it's a very it's it's, it's going to be a big December for Oxford like a lot of teams that are going to be down there and we're going to probably repeat the same thing over a uh, a couple of the teams that we're going to speak about momentarily. But yeah, big December coming up for, for Oxford. Um, and if they can get to January and be above the relegation zone and you know, separate them very comfortably points-wise, then you know, it's a chance to reset reset in January, maybe get a couple more additions and, and see what's what. Wayne Rooney's Plymouth Argyle is up next. Justin Peach, they're currently 18th in the table. Higher or lower? Lower. Yeah, lower with me as well. Um, we mentioned in part one of higher or lower how Middlesbrough are in a false position and really should be higher. I think Plymouth are probably in a false position and really should be lower because <laughs> they have been <laughs> astonishingly poor recently. And it's a surprise to still, still see them sat 18th. And look, I'm sure a section of Plymouth fans will claim this to be part of a continued agenda against Wayne Rooney. But even the most optimistic Plymouth fan must be concerned about recent performances, Justin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, when you consider the fact that they've got, they, they are very chance shy, if you like, uh, they don't create a lot of chances and they concede a lot of chances. It's a very unhealthy um, well, mix to have, isn't it? And I think with that in mind, 
and you know several other games and as the season has gone on it's very hard to make a convincing case that Plymouth will not be lower than 18th come the end of the season um, and as you say yeah they have been poor I know they picked up the win um, a couple of games ago against Portsmouth which was a, which was a big one but again they didn't really convince then um, so yeah it, I, I don't, what Wayne Rooney really is trying to trying to do is you know he's, he's trying to create a team that's that is galvanized by adversity. Um, but it's very difficult to, to do that when there's, you know, the only thing that's going against you is a manager with a really poor record at championship level, to be very blunt. Um, so yeah, with Plymouth, as I say, it's just very hard to make a convincing case that they will not be lower than 18th come, come May. Yeah. Well, they've only lost three of the last six, but the three they didn't lose, they probably should have. I mean, the Derby game in their most recent game was a, a good microcosm, really, of what Plymouth have because defensively they did really well in that game but going forwards they offered next to nothing I think the injury to Ibrahim Sissoko has really kneecapped them because their only real outlet going forwards now is Morgan Whitaker and he's not been at the same standard as he was last season so that's something they need to address in January and as we mentioned on several occasions they're hopeless away not amazing at home either I think they've been a bit fortunate for their results to have been as good as they have at home park. So with that being said, I mean, we're saying they'll finish, we're saying they'll finish lower than 18th. I'd be very surprised if Plymouth actually stayed up this season. If they do stay up, it would without a doubt be Wayne Rooney's greatest managerial achievement yet. And probably go on to be possibly the greatest he'll ever, ever accomplish, Justin. (laughs) Probably a bit harsh, but... um... Let's be honest. (laughs) Well, Put it this way: Do we see Wayne Rooney getting many more championship jobs after this? Well, it depends what that... he does. Depends what he well, does because there'll be a, there'll, well, there'll be naive up, then, yeah. yeah, if he keeps them up, there'll be naive owners who who are still romanticised by the name of Wayne Rooney. But you look at you just look at individuals in this team. For example, Morgan Whitaker is is nowhere near as as risk takey if you like, as he has been in in previous well last season. Well, even just under Stephen Schumacher, actually, Ibrahim Sissoko is, a, is you know is the you know, shining light so far this season. Bally Mumba hasn't looked close to his best. Ryan Hardy is starved of service. He's got one goal to his name this season. Michael Abafemi has looked sharp in places, but nowhere near consistent enough to to do anything. And, and, and unfortunately, that is not a Plymouth thing. They've had a very poor couple of managers in Ian Foster and now Wayne Rooney who just aren't seeing the benefits and the quality of this team. And you've got to, you've just got to allow them to express themselves. And I think they need a manager who does that. And I don't think either of those two are, are a case of that. Because if you look at the Leeds game in isolation, yes, they were going to go up and lose, but they went to lose, if that makes sense. They you know, went almost to, felt, felt, felt like to keep the score down. Whereas I think, uh, you know, a, a Plymouth side of, of old, would have had a go, would have taken uh, chances, would have taken risks. They did nothing, even against Derby. It was a good draw, very good draw, and there was there was moments of um, positive positivity to come out of that game. But again, there are opportunities there to express yourself as a team, and they just they don't they don't. I don't see anything. I don't see a, a style of play or anything with Plymouth, and I think that's the key thing. And that's that lends into what we we're talking about with Wayne Rooney. Yeah, that's why I say it'll be his greatest managerial achievement he'll probably ever accomplish if, if he does keep them up because I don't see him having many other opportunities at this level after this, um, whether he keeps them up or not. Let's go on to the other side on the South Coast. It's Portsmouth. They currently sit 23rd in the championship table, just in higher or lower with Portsmouth. No change, Ryan, no change. Really? Yes. Okay. Yes. Why is okay. that a surprise? Well, Come on. Well, I've gone higher. Why do you say no change? I I need to see a lot more from Portsmouth to be convinced that they can finish higher. Uh, and that needs to be over the next few weeks. Um, because what I've seen so far is a team that has been second best in all but four games this season, which is not an ideal place to be. They've got a very leaky defence. You know, we're talking about how leaky Plymouth were. Portsmouth have conceded 26 goals this season. They also concede a lot of chances if you look at the XG. I think Colby Bishop returning will be a big boost, but he doesn't cover other weaknesses in the team, which is a lack of athleticism in midfield, for example. So there are, I would say, big problems with this Portsmouth team that needs addressing in January, but they could be cut adrift. Come come then. Well, um, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm not 
as down on Portsmouth as you are, I've got to say. I think there's obviously been a lot of disappointments out about how they start to the season because one win in 14 will do that. But I am starting to sense positivity coming out of Portsmouth fans that they are starting to turn a corner. I think the win last weekend against Preston felt like a significant one. And don't get me wrong, there's a long way to go to actually secure safety because there are problems in this Portsmouth team. But optimism has risen. Um, And a lot of that is down to Colby Bishop being back. Must be said, he's coming back from a pretty serious procedure. So he needs to take his time with that. You don't want to rush him. But it will be a big boost when he's back starting games. I've been saying for a while that Portsmouth's performances haven't been as bad as their results perhaps suggest. I think the attacking trio of Callum Lang, Matt Ritchie and Josh Murphy has looked very bright recently. And Portsmouth have got winnable games all the way up until the end of the year. So I can definitely see them being higher by then by then than they are now. And then hopefully they can strengthen the squad in January and fill the gaps that they should have filled in the summer. Um, don't get me wrong, the aim is obviously just to stay up at this stage and there's a lot of work that needs doing to secure that. But I'm certainly not feeling as down on Portsmouth as you are from the sound of it, Justin. Yeah, and you've been very optimistic about Portsmouth um, pretty much for the entire season. And I think you can give them some benefit of that with a poor start, but they just haven't responded to that. They haven't yet got going. And that's a, you know, it's very difficult then in the Championship to uh, you know, carry on accumulating points when your confidence is down and weaknesses have been picked in your team already because you've been you know, well and truly you know, short changed with the fixture of you know, running fixtures you've had. Um, but unfortunately, that's just, <laughs> that's just how it works. I just don't think Portsmouth really have adapted to, to life in the championship. And I think with that one win, a good win, doesn't scream uh, turning a corner. Like I said, I just need more games to convince me. And if they've got winnable games between now and December, now's the time to start picking up points and and, and show <laughs> show the rest of us, or prove us all wrong, I, I guess, the, you know, the doubters, if you like. Hmm. I'm not a doubter. I'm fully, fully believing in John Moussinho and uh, Portsmouth in being able to turn it around. Because I think they've still got a lot more to give. We haven't seen the best of Portsmouth by any means yet in the championship this season. Let's go up to Preston North End, currently 20th in the championship. 20th seems very low, doesn't it? I was a bit surprised when, <laughs> when I was writing this down and saw that they were 20th. Um, higher or lower, Justin? I've gone higher. I've gone higher as well. Uh, Yeah, Preston are a funny one, aren't they? Because for several years now, no matter how badly or how well they start a season, Preston always gets sucked back into the Preston zone because they finished between 7th and 14th for the past nine seasons. And considering their start to this season... That might not be the case. So I think right now, Justin, they'd probably take somewhere between 7th and 14th, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, without without a doubt. It's been a tumultuous season for Preston, unlike any other season, really. Yeah, Preston are a very, it's, it's, it's going to sound harsh, but from the outside in, they're a very boring club. They don't really turn up trees and they don't really upset the apple cart. They're just, they're just very Preston. And I say that is a Preston zone, but... They would love to be there, as you say, right now, because of how tumultuous things have been. You know, Ryan Lowe leaving after a game is quite, quite a shocking, uh, well, I guess, revelation for any championship team. You know, for your manager to leave after one game, all that work you do in pre-season has completely gone up in the air, and you want to start again. And I think that's what we're seeing with Paul Heckingbottom now. Is we've seen a lot of positives, we've seen a lot of negatives, and I think he's just finding his feet with this team. But with that in mind. I do think they have the quality to, to push higher. And I do think Paul Hackenbottom is a good manager to help him push higher. It's just uh, it's just pushing higher. It's just developing, get, get, getting results and going. Yeah, yeah, that certainly does help, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I suppose when you take into account the the start of losing Ryan Lowe after one game and then losing their interim manager after the second game, it is a, <laughs> yeah, it is a bit chaotic. <laughs> and so 20th might not actually be too bad an outcome for Preston after 15 games. Um the thing is, it looked like Preston were turning a corner when they went five games unbeaten, but that collapse against Plymouth seems to have really set them back and there seems to be a lot of mixed feelings around the fan base now. Some are saying, we'll get back to our usual sort of position eventually. Others are saying, if we're not careful, we could sleepwalk into a relegation battle. I'm not totally convinced about either happening, but on, on the balance of probability, I'd say it's more likely that they do end up back in mid-table obscurity in some shape or form mainly because 
there are a decent handful of sides who I think are weaker than this Preston side. But I do think they are a club at risk of going stale, Justin. Alex Neal was speaking about Preston the other day and he pointed out that he signed a lot of the players in this squad. Mm Mm-hmm. He hasn't been there for years. So how many <laughs> how many signings have they made in that time who have significantly improved the squad? Not yeah, many. Yeah, are there? Yeah. So uh, the the thing is when you're when you're doing that and you're just like sort of coasting along without making any great advances over a significant period of time, it's only natural that you will begin to regress over time. So that's why it won't surprise me if this is actually a season where Preston aren't a mid-table side for once and are maybe looking over their shoulder a bit as as time goes on, Justin. Or maybe the maybe a maybe a relegation fight is the is the shock they need a little bit to to reignite the the, the club and push them and push them higher. It can it can work. We you know we have seen it with. Yeah, we, with certain teams who have gone from being very poor to, to very good in the space of a season. And I think it's, 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 I think it's very fair for Preston fans to be a little bit pessimistic, um, going into it and, and, and be looking over their shoulder because as you say, growing stale is, is a difficult thing to stave off in the championship, especially when you're Preston side who have done it for so long. You know, they have sold, you know, a decent amount of players over the years. You know, you going way back now, but Callum Robinson was sold. Was he really replaced? For example, Ben Davis was sold. Was he really replaced? No. You know, they, they, they've always, they've always signed average championship players and they've tried to get a little bit more out of them. And unfortunately, they've just continued to be average. Unless you get a very, you, a groundbreaking coach. And there's no disrespect to the likes of Paul Heckingbott and Ryan Lowe, Alex Neal or anybody else. But they're all very t- steady championship managers. Maybe the argument is out on, on Ryan Lowe there, but steady doesn't get you higher, does it? I mean, the draw is out on Paul Heckingbottom still, but as I say, steady doesn't get you, you know, it doesn't push you higher. It doesn't push you higher. You, you, just, you just, as you say, coast. And I think that's where Preston have found themselves. But I think there is positives to take from the recent weeks. Emma Reese is, is looking sharp. Matt, uh, Matt Rock Ayenton is looking is, is looking really good. Ali McCann has looked you know, very positive. Sam Greenwood is amongst the goals. So I think you know, we are seeing good signs, positive signs under Paul Heckingbottom. It's just, it's just I don't think I, I think coming in later on in August is is, is probably set the club back a little bit. I think uh, you saying what you're saying there, Justin. All those players are doing okay, but none of them are like really standing out that much, are they? And that's that's just been a problem with Preston for a long time now. A lot of six out of 10 energy with with Preston. And um, that's why it wouldn't be a massive surprise if they were to actually have a season where they were to regress. Let's go to Queen's Park Rangers. Of course, the team currently holding up the rest of the championship table with uh, them being 24th. Um, higher or lower, Justin? <laughs> I've gone higher. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I've gone higher as well. We put out the tweet earlier in the week asking people where they think their club will finish higher or lower. We had keep your office fans responding by saying, well, we can't finish any lower. So <laughs> the only way is up from a QPR perspective. Uh, yeah, not the club I expected to be bottom of the table, a third of the way through the season. I think that's uh, that's very clear. We spoke about their problems at length last weekend, Justin, and quite a lot in general in recent weeks. So we don't need to spend a massive amount of time on them and where it's going wrong. But how much of their expectations changed with this poor start, do you think? <laughs> you're, yeah, you're firefighting now, aren't you? <laughs> you're just shitting yourself if you're a QPR fan because... <laughs> You, what you had last season was a very average to poor squad with a very average to poor manager, to be really polite, at the start of last season in Gareth Ainsworth. Then you had a very good manager come in and lift them. Now you've got a very good manager and still a very poor to average squad. And it's just a little bit of a hangover happening. So yeah, you're absolutely shitting yourself. And I think that optimism at the start of the season where... You do, I think you, everyone, every fan will get carried away, but you do start to think, okay, maybe, well, maybe with Marty Sifuentes, because he's a very talented coach, maybe we can push higher. Maybe we, maybe we can flip with the playoffs. Maybe, or maybe. Um, but now it's just a case of if we finish 21st buzzing. But I think, yeah, I, you know, uh, quite some, some telling comments from Asmir Begovic earlier on in the week on another podcast saying that the club is trying to buy better for cheaper, um, which as, as he said, it doesn't really work like that. And it's probably quite telling of where they are now. And we're seeing that, you know, Chris Willick, Sinclair Armstrong, Lyndon Dykes all left last season uh, and this season, sorry, or in the summer. 
have they really been replaced? I mean, they're not all groundbreaking players, but they're still you know good championship players, if you like. Well, at the start of the season, I would have said the aim this season would have been just to improve on last season. And now you would say a repeat of last season is probably the best case scenario, <laughs> isn't it? I, I don't think they'll finish bottom of the table. I'm I'm pretty confident in the saying that. And if you asked me a few weeks ago, I'd have said they'll definitely climb away from the relegation zone eventually. But my faith in that happening does deteriorate as weeks go by and we see yet another poor performance. Because I don't think they've been the worst team in the league, but it's hard to deny that they have been one of the worst teams in the league based purely on the eye test. Mm -hmm. um, but look, this squad shouldn't be going down in my eyes, but we've said that before about other teams who have gone down. So we'll see what happens with the manager situation, I suppose. See if they have any luck in turning the ship around because, yeah, it's not looking ideal from a QPR perspective. That's got to be said. You mentioned Gareth Hainsworth there, Justin. He's back in work at Shrewsbury, isn't he? Monster energy drinks all round. Yeah, well, the phrase, back in a job. That's a Game of Thrones joke. You won't get it because you've not watched it, but Game of Thrones watchers will understand it. Mm, okay, I don't understand it, even though I, I've watched about half of Game of Thrones, but I got bored halfway through. There you go. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's good to see that he's uh, back in work, I guess. Um, he's had a nice time hibernating in his goth cave. I wonder if he'll change his outfit. No, of course he won't. <laughs> Dark blue shirt. Grey jeans, brown belt, brown shoes, or brown boots. Yeah. The no matter Hainsworth what time TM of year it is, trademark. he'll be wearing he'll be wearing the same thing, won't he? Without any failure. Top, top one's undone. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Sheffield United. Of course, currently second in the championship table, just in higher or lower. No change. I've also gone no change. Yeah. I mean, it's my only no change I think I've got in the whole of these two episodes. Oh. Um, but if you ask me right now, I think Leeds to win the league with Sheffield United second is the most likely scenario this season. I think they're the strongest teams in the league. But I tell you what, I've been more impressed with Sheffield United so far this season than Leeds. So definitely wouldn't rule them out winning the league, Justin. It's all about peaking at the right time, isn't it? And I don't think uh, I don't think either Leeds or Sheffield United have, have peaked by any by any means. But I think Leeds have probably got the potential to peak at the perfect time compared to Sheffield United. And what I mean by that is, I think in the first half of the season you can get away with not changing changing a team too much. You know, you've not had a you know an abundance of games. December's the big month, isn't it? Because it's horrendous. You know, games you have to play. And that's where your strength and depth is going to come into it's coming to thinking, and that's maybe where Sheffield United might might come unstuck. I don't think that, I, I don't think it'll be a massive problem or a massive thing, but it might allow Leeds to creep above them and sneak into top spot, and you know build a solid foundation to mount that title charge, as Daniel Farker sides have done in in previous years, apart from last season. Um, you know Norwich teams, his Norwich teams, very good at peaking at the right time. But as I say, I digress. Injuries are, are a big thing, and, and I think Touchwood, Sheffield United have not had any injury, any injury problems or any anywhere near as as it has been in, in years gone by. And with that, the new takeover being done or potentially being done soon, that makes January a good month to go out and recruit. So I think the wind is in Sheffield United's sails. It's just whether or not the uh, you know Leeds have got theirs sorted already, if you like. Well, I think if the last four games are a sign of anything to of, of things to come with Sheffield United, then. They'll be a difficult team to stop. I, I know I bang on about consistency all the time, but it is essential when it comes to winning promotion from the championship. Sheffield United have so far shown more consistency than Leeds and Burnley. And they also have a stronger squad in my eyes than any of the other promotion contenders outside of Leeds and Burnley. And that's why we're bigging them up so much because in terms of pure strength on paper at Sheffield United, Leeds and Burnley, maybe Middlesbrough as well, actually, but there's a fair gap between those teams and some of the others. And if you're looking for things that could hold them back, goals, possibly Gustavo Hamer's the top scorer so far with four. Kiefer Moore's been a bit disappointing up front. Tyrese Campbell has got a few, but can you rely on him with his goal tallies in recent seasons? Not sure. I still can't shake the feeling we've got a Chris Wilder meltdown happening at some point either this season. But overall, Sheffield United are probably best positioned to go on and get promoted, as things stands, Justin, in my eyes. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, Keith Moore hasn't yet got going and he's he's good for sort of 10, 15 goals, isn't he, quite easily. He's, he's played a big role in, in several teams being promoted, which 
Bournemouth. Um, you know, was a mainstay with with um, with Cardiff as well. So he's, you know, him scoring goals at some point and it clicking for him is, is going to be a big thing. Um, and as well as that, they've they've you know Tyrese Campbell's hitting form. I think there are a lot of positives for Sheffield United. I do disagree. I don't think we've got a Chris Wilder meltdown on the way. I, I do think. He's changed significantly. He's, he's really just, good. Just you wait. Just you wait until a, a linesman pulls out a sandwich. <laughs> the red well, mist will descend. Yeah, if we're talking about Chris Wilder and his relationship with food, I think he's more accepting of it because he was singing about sausage rolls after the, uh, yes. the Steel City derby. I don't know whether that's a slight towards a, an opposition manager or not, but he clearly loves <laughs> sausage rolls. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that relationship with food has, has changed. So, but I can't see a, rela- a food based meltdown anytime soon. I do get what you mean, but I do think he's turned a corner. Sheffield United have turned a corner and that corner is promotion. Maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, we haven't actually mentioned the, um, the Chris Wilder celebrations after the uh, Steel City derby, have they? It was, it was bizarre seeing Joe Root in those videos. Oh, as yeah, well. that was <laughs> such Joe a random. Root? Yeah, because I don't follow cricket, and you know, I, I someone did point it out in the caption. And I was like, oh yeah, he's Joe Root. Interesting. Yeah, it, it was very confusing, but I did enjoy uh, Chris Wilder's celebrations. He looked like he had a nice time, which is uh, which is a. Uh, Good to see. But on to Sheffield Wednesday. Currently 15th in the championship, higher or lower? I've gone no change. No change, okay. I've gone higher. Um, you're saying a team who are 15th are more likely to finish 15th than finish higher or lower? I, I uh, Yeah, I, I do. I do. I, I, it's, it's, I think they will, they, will, they will go up, they'll go down, but I think 15th in and around 15th is, is abs- you know, it's absolutely fair to suggest because they're a team that's inconsistent uh, for starters and consistency is a hard thing to muster up. January won't be a uh, a month of big movement either for 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 Wednesday. But I don't I don't think they'll finish lower. I think there are a lot of teams in my opinion um that um that aren't going to aren't going to drop off and they aren't going to push higher. I I've gone higher. Um and it's got to be said Sheffield Wednesday have probably been the most inconsistent team in the championship so far their barometer of their bad performances and good performances is really all over the place isn't it them winning 4-0 on the opening day and then losing 4-0 the week after is a actually a brilliant microcosm of how their season has gone so far because <laughs> you never know what you're going to get with Wednesday just a proper box of chocolates stuff with them <laughs> um, and that's why it's 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 probably in defense of you more likely that they're going to finish lower than higher Mm, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for proving my point. Um, as I was saying, I, I just I think there are a lot of players who haven't got going yet in a Wednesday shirt and, and it's a case of will they get going? I think they'll capture some form and, and, and they'll drop off again. Ike Ugbo has been really disappointing after being very, very important for Wednesday last season. Gasama and Masabi as well have yet to really display any consistency, um, which again is, is very frustrating because they are players that I really, really like. Got a bit of an injury crisis in defence as well. Um, I say an injury crisis. They're missing a few key players in defence, which again is going to impact things. Which is, which is why I say no change. Which is why I think they'll finish sort of fourteenth, fifteenth, sixteenth, if you like. I don't, I don't think it'll be much higher or lower than than in that bracket of teams. You know, the Preston zone, if you like. Um, you know, I think they can push up to twelve. I think they can drop to nineteenth, which is why I think it will average out for them this season. It's still a good year. I do think it's still a good year if they finish 15th because they've had a lot of changes in the summer, not a hell of a lot of money to spend. Um, and I think Danny Rawls probably still find his feet with a team that he's trying to instill a different philosophy on. The crazy thing is they were pretty consistent at the end under Danny <laughs> Rawls last season, weren't they? From the start of December onwards, they were ticking along very nicely. Still had the odd bad loss in there, but it, of course, led to them completing that ridiculous survival job in the end. And now they've got a stronger squad and not picking up results as well as they should be. So it's rather strange. But look, I'm pretty sure Wednesday will be fine this season. And I'd be a bit disappointed if they finished as low as 15th, hence why I've said they'll finish higher. Uh, it will be progress on last season. If they did finish 15th, we shouldn't forget that. It would help if they had a firing striker, because as you mentioned, EK Ugbo has been a massive disappointment so far. Jamal Lowe hasn't scored a league goal since the opening day. They've got Michael Smith. 
but it is Michael Smith. He doesn't score goals like the one he did against Portsmouth every week. <laughs> so <laughs> what's that? that's what's got to improve for Wednesday, that and their consistency. If to do that, I could see them finishing in the top half. I think they've got the chance of doing that, Justin. If, though, isn't it? It's an if. It's a big oh, yeah, if. of course. But uh, as I say, I, I'm not overly convinced that they, they can possibly do it. You know, the stars have really got to align for them. And I think when you're handling a bit of a transition year with a big upheaval of players, um, probably still players that they need to get rid of as well um, in, in January and move on uh, and try and freshen up as well. But they, they're going to do that without too many finances at play. It's, it's going to be difficult. So I think that transition aspect is a, is a, is a big, uh, you know, motivator for my thinking here but I think with Danny Rule there's a potential for for anything but I think another factor in uh, that we need to consider for for quite a lot of teams actually is you know Danny Rule came in and was firefighting you know they were, everyone was motivated to to turn turn things around they don't have that this season because they're probably going to comfortably finish you know lower mid table if you like there's nothing to fight for or against um which is not to say the players aren't going to give everything, but you know, there's not a situation that's going to galvanise a group like it did last season. So that's going to play into things, I think, a little bit. But for Sheffield Wednesday and a lot of teams as well. The other factor is there's also the risk of a inspired meltdown by Chancery at some points. Um, that's always the case with Sheffield Wednesday, so that's definitely worth keeping in mind. It is worth saying he has now paid off a bill to HMRC, which saw them under a registration embargo. Um, but just a just a cheeky reminder from... Oh, Dave Pond, that uh, <laughs> he's lurking in the background as always. Let's go on to Stoke City next. Currently 13th in the table, just in higher or lower? Lower. Lower. I have also gone lower. Yeah, I was a, I was a, a Stoke were another club actually who, when I was writing down the uh, league table position of each team, I was a bit surprised to see them. 13th because it feels like they haven't been brilliant since Narciss Palach has come in but I suppose the table doesn't lie um, I've seen some Stoke fans say they're actually feeling quite optimistic about this season Justin they could finish higher do you have any optimism with them there? I will firstly um, admit that I again put no change but in the interest of the game we're playing I will play into it and uh, we can discuss things at length. I think they will finish mid-table, but I think the most likelihood here, mathematically, is them probably going to finish lower. Um, I, I, I think there is room to be optimistic, though, for Stoke fans. It's just I the reason why I've, I've, I've ended up saying lower, not high, is because I've, I've not seen enough from Palach over his tenure so far, short one, that is, worth bearing in mind that they are going to push higher. They are unbeaten in their last three, which is good, but we you know, need to keep churning results. And, um, you know, Millwall are, you know, steamrolling teams, for example, and they're, they, they've pushed up to eighth. You know, that's the difference with consistency. I think the squad is quality in, uh, enough to, to push higher. It's just, you know, there are a lot of indi- individuals like, um, you know, uh, Mainhoff, Kumas, Junho, Moran, Tom Cannon up front. Um, I think it's just a case of Palace trying to find that balance with this team. Uh, you know, trying to allow that creative quality to thrive, create chances and get out on a consistent basis. But yeah, I can see why Stoke fans are feeling optimistic. But right now, it's quite hard to see them finishing higher than 13th. Yeah, considering Stoke were in serious danger of going down last season, I find it difficult to be seriously encouraged that they'll trouble the top half this season. I would like it if it did happen because I always respect clubs giving a coach their first real shot at management I know Palach was a manager in Spain but it's nowhere near the same level as this from what I've seen so far has there been enough evidence that this will be the first season in seven years where Stoke finish (laughs) higher than 14th I don't think so because they're giving away a lot of chances the underlying numbers say they've actually been a bit fortunate in plenty of recent games so I don't share the optimism that some Stoke fans may have. I think it's going to take a lot longer than eight months in charge for Narcissus Palach to break Stoke out of their mould, which they've uh, put together for themselves over quite a few years now, Justin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. And again, the inexperience of the head coach Palach with the technical director, John Ivan Walters, and um, the owner as well, you know, do Stoke are a team that are going to go through the motions, I think. And it's just whether or not the Stoke fans have got patience. I mean, they don't really turn up in the numbers at the bet 365 anymore, which tells you that 
you know, a lot of people have lost patience. So I think with Stoke and Palach, rather than you know saying we're you know, banging the bell, saying we're going to push for promotion, get people to fall in love with that football club again. You know, get people arriving in their numbers because it's a horrible place to go when it's loud and and full. You know, Arsene Wenger hated it, for example, one of the world's best coaches. So I think you know, getting getting an environment like that is is the is the absolute must for Stoke. And then building from there, get fans back in the ground and enjoying that football again. Um, and then and let's see where you go. We'll go into the team at the tippy top of the table now. Justin, it's Sunderland. First in the table. Um, I will lower. I've gone lower. I can only go lower. <laughs> yeah, I've gone lower. It was either no change or lower. Want it. Um, yeah, I had it. Look, there's absolutely no denying that this has been the start of the season of dreams for Sunderland. We've mentioned it pretty much every week. They've been sensational from the word go. But I think Sunderland fans are being realistic with the remainder of the season, not just because of a slight dip in form recently, but also because this is a young squad, isn't it? They're bound to have their ups and downs over a long championship season. Having said that, They've put themselves well in the conversation for the automatics, haven't they? Yeah, they have. They have. And they, they deserve to be top of the table because they've been you know, incredibly consistent and a very difficult team to beat. But I think we have seen some naivety drop into their performances at time. I mean, you go back to that Plymouth second half performance before the first international break, if I remember rightly. And obviously the Coventry one as well um, before this international break. There are there is some naivety and a reminder that this team is very young. Um, I do see them being a title contender as the season goes on. It's just whether or not Leeds and Chevronite are better than them, and that might prevail over the course of the season. But this has been an incredible start. It's an incredible, you know, it's a reminder that how incredible this young group is, because of the fact that they've sustained this form for as long as they have for the first third of the season, I think is I think is brilliant and a, and, a, and a nod to the hat to you know smart recruitment and 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 you know brave choices with picking a head coach as well. There are a lot of owners who I think can. You know, aside from last season and Mick Beal, but there are a lot of owners who can take note from Sunderland's bravery. Um, and even, you know, maybe Stoke if Palach works out as well. But yeah, I think with Sunderland, you know, we've got a team here who mean business. They mean business. And it's not, I don't mean that, you know, condescendingly. You know, I mean that, you know, they, they've shown and, and proved that they can compete. Or if they get to January, either in the top two or with the top two still in touching distance, then that's massive, isn't it? Because they can get reinforcements in and that could inspire them to keep pace with the other top two contenders. I do think they'll need reinforcements because they have been fairly fortunate with injuries so far. I know they lost Ballard and Mayenda early on, but by and large, they've had the same starting eleven each week up until very recently. And perhaps that's been reflected in results. So that's why they need to strengthen you cannot underestimate this Sunderland team, though, because they've shown a few times already that they have a brilliant knack of shaking off whatever is thrown at them. So don't be surprised if they do go all the way and win promotion this season. As we say, it will be difficult with the twists and turns of a championship season, but this young side are fearless. And uh, Regis, Regis Labrie had these black cats purring on plenty of occasions, <laughs> Justin. <laughs> Yeah, purring again. I think it's just a nod to, you know, bravery in in both recruitment, taking risks, and, and it all being measured. And it's all it's all come to head. You know, it might be a different conversation had it had it not happened. But I think the proof is in is in what we're seeing now. You know, a team that is expressing themselves and um, getting results as well. And you can't really deny that and take that away from them. They've been brilliant so far, and long may that one continue. If Regis Labris has the Black Cats purring, then I'll be interested to know what Luke Williams has got Swansea doing just in there, 11th, and they're the team up next. Have you got them higher or lower? Uh, I've got them lower. I think Luke Williams has got the Swans hissing so far. Hissing, um, squawking? They, 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 they honk, squawk, don't they? They honk. honk. Yeah. Hiss. Hiss or honk? So you're yeah. saying hiss. I'm also going hiss. And um, why? Why do you say hiss, Justin? <laughs> um, well, swans when they're in danger, they hiss, don't they? Mm. Um, and they they get quite defensive, if you like. And I think that's where <laughs> swans are going at the moment. They're a hard side to predict, much like a swan. If you meet a swan on a path, you have no idea if it's going to try and attack you or not. And therefore, mm. as I say, very difficult to predict. Wildlife with Justin Peach. You're welcome, listeners. Um, 
but I think you know they've had performances this season that would make you go, "Ooh, yeah, they, they can push higher." You know, the 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 win against Watford, uh, Oxford, Preston, but that's not as been as um, uh, regular as the games that remind you the lengths that this team does have to go, like the Millwall defeat, Blackburn defeat, West Brom defeat, a lot of draws, big goalless run as well. Squad depth is obviously an issue. New takeover is on the horizon, but that will that be done in time in January? Maybe not. I think it's a transition year. I don't think that's a negative. I think Swansea, you know, in eleventh place right now, is 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 a good position to be in. But can they push higher than that for this season with the squad they got? Ah, uh, yeah, no, not not for me. Yeah, considering Swans are known for being quite aggressive, we haven't really seen that with these Swans, have they? Because considering they've been so goal shy recently, they could do with being a bit more aggressive. Um, look. Two wins in nine is um, not great, but I think Swansea have actually been playing pretty well during this recent run. They've mm-hmm. had quite a few nasty injuries recently, um, dealt with them pretty well, even though they have got a paper thin squad. The big issue for them in the last two, last month or two is obvious, as I say, scoring goals. Going out over nine hours without a goal at one point is a pretty good example of uh, why they definitely need to improve in that regard. But uh, I've said this on plenty of occasions. That starting 11 for Swansea, for me, it's got a lot. There's a lot there for Luke Williams to work with. I think it's a really, really strong starting 11. It certainly gives a foundation for them to make some progress moving forward. It is just the squad depth, which may become more of a burden for Swansea as time goes on. Hmm. So Luke Williams has definitely got the tools to work with here. He just needs more tools to work with to make sure that when he does lose one of those tools, he's not left um, not left empty-handed. Um, so that's something that they definitely need to work with. But I, I completely agree with you, Justin. I think it is a transition season. I don't think that's a bad thing for Swansea. They've had a few transition seasons in the past couple of seasons. Um, but this one really, really does feel like one, especially with the takeover happening off the pitch now. Well, once that takeover is done, then who knows? Maybe they can build to being a genuine top six contender. I struggle yeah. to see that happening this season, though, for all the reasons that we've just stated previously. But I, I think something is bubbling at Swansea. At the mm-hmm. moment, it's just kind of a simmering bubbling. It's not like a, you know, massive bubbling. It's not, you know, needs to come off the boil kind of bubbling. Um, but there's definitely something happening at Swansea. Yeah, I completely agree. And I just wanted to praise Luke Williams really for handling a situation that other managers have spoke out on quite quite, quite vocally, haven't they? Steve Cooper was critical of the ownership. Uh, Russell Martin was critical of the ownership. Michael Duff didn't have time to be critical of the ownership, but I'm sure he had a few choice words to say when they when they sacked him, knowing he wasn't the right manager in charge uh, for the club. Um, but you know, Luke Williams has has sort of gone in there, dealt with it very very well. Because yeah, I think Swansea's a very weird case, isn't it? Because they just got ambitiousless owners, and they're probably they're probably the worst ones um, because they, they've not really invested in the squad. Luke Williams has, and what he's delivered so far this season, I think, is very positive in, in terms of what he's got at his disposal. Um, so I think, yeah, he deserves a lot of praise in in, in managing a situation so calmly, uh, as opposed to you know other managers speaking out uh, against the owners. And rightly so, they've been shit. But you know that's probably not going to be the case for much longer. Let's go to Watford. The big surprise package of the season so far, without a doubt, currently sixth in the table, just in higher or lower? I've gone lower. I've also gone lower, which I don't think is a massive surprise, really, considering this has been a ridiculous start from Watford, which nobody really expected, especially Watford fans, considering how uh, how dismayed they were with the lack of investments in the club over the summer. Um, and Tom Cleverley has done an unbelievable job so mm. far this season. But I think even the most optimistic Watford fan would not expect this to continue. Having said that, do you think expectations have changed for Watford after this uh, incredible start, Justin? I think with a lot of fans that it will change expectations because if you're in a third of the way through the season and you are batting in around the top six, you are going to, you know, have that optimism remain. Um, and if you drop away, it feels like a failure. But I think with this Watford team, I would say 90% of people predicted them to go down. A lot of Watford fans weren't particularly optimistic. Um, the squad isn't. I still don't think it's you know packed full of quality either. I think there's a lot of gaps in it. 
you know, there's lots of good attacking dribblers. There's lots of pace. There's there is there is quality uh, and ingenuity. You know, Jack Vertadze, I think, is a player who can win a game on his own. But his goal and assist record does still need to improve. Um, defensively, I think they've got a very good back line. Although away from home, it does raise some questions. Uh, and then you've got Vakun Bayo and 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 Edo Kiembe, who are their top scorers this season, who are, I think are both massively incon- uh, unconvincing as. <laughs> Footballers, let alone um, <laughs> players. <laughs> but here they are. They, they're they scoring goals. They're creating chances. And um, they are in around the top six. And I think that's down to the quality of work that Tom Cleverley is doing. That being said, they're very poor away from home. Um, and, you know, despite their home record being good, they probably don't create enough chances for them to, for me, convincingly keep winning games. So it's, it's, they're, they're a very weird case, Watford. I, I've really struggled to put my finger on them. But... I think one thing you can say is you just cannot take away from the quality of work that Tom Clever has done. But as they finish between 6th and 14th, I think that's a really good year still. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I don't think the incredible start that they've had should take away from how incredible it's been. Because I think a drop-off for Watford is inevitable. But if they were to finish mid-table, even top half, um, then that would be... An incredible season for Watford, really, in the circumstances, because this is a this is a team which has had not much investment in it, is there? Mm-hmm. Um, I would be concerned about chat for Tadzi because he has been linked with a move to the Premier League. I can completely understand why clubs are having a look at him, considering how good he is and how well he's played this season. Um, I think the, the, the Vakun Bayo's goal scoring hot streak. I'm going to go out on the limb here and say it may only be a temporary kind of thing. Um, I'd, I'd be surprised if that continues for the remainder of the season. Um, but look, there's plenty of positives to take from it as well. I think Festi Abiselli is just such an exciting, thrilling player who mm-hmm. we saw loads when he was at Derby, Justin. But um, yeah, he, he's, a, he's a really thrilling player. I think Matty Pollock is having the season of his life so far. And if his form is anything to go by, then he will continue to be a pivotal player for Watford as the season goes on. It's strange because Watford have, if you look at the underlying numbers, have been one of the best teams in terms of creating chances in the division so far. But they've also been one of the worst teams at giving away chances. So that that kind of shows the sort of inconsistency which has kind of fallen on their side so far. Maybe they have been a bit fortunate on a few occasions so far this season and maybe that will balance out as time goes on. Um, their away form is also something that definitely needs to improve. But look, I don't think you can give enough praise to, to Tom Cleverley for the job that he's done so far because many were worried about them going down this season. He's pretty much eradicated any chance of that happening after 10 games of the season, hasn't he? So with that in mind... Tom Cleverley has done a superb, incredible job, Justin. Yeah, 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 he has, he has. Um, And, you know, he's he's a rookie manager. He's a rookie manager and his home record at the club is brilliant. I don't think that's by... You know, by by accident, is it? Or by chance, he's he's completely transformed um, the the, the club around or the the fortunes of the club because they were a club that were... They were heading down a, a, a really worrying spiral, really worrying spiral, you know, they just struggled with identity. They struggled with, you know, choice of manager. But I think Tom Cleverley coming from where he's come from and playing with the club, coaching at the youth level, and now as manager, he he understands it. He understands the culture. He knows the players that are coming through, and um, you can tell that they respect him. And that's a big, big thing in that uh, that football club because it's a basket case of a, of a club because of the owners. Uh, and Tom Cleverley's sort of dampened down those perceptions. I think that's probably the biggest success, rather than where they are in the table. It's probably probably that probably what he's done off the pitch. Watford needed an, a, a leader, didn't they? They needed the they leader and Tom Cleverley has proven to be that. That's why the job that he's done has just been so remarkable, really. Let's go to the final club in this game of higher or lower, Justin. It's, of course, West Bromwich Albion, currently fifth in the championship table. Are you going higher or lower with them? I'm going lower. I've gone slightly lower. I think it says something about the consistency of Carlos Corbrandt teams that we've that they've gone through a bad run and are still in the playoffs, Justin. Mm-hmm. It's remarkable, really. It's, yeah. And that's why I'm pretty sure they will be competing for a playoff place again this season. Hence why I've only gone slightly lower. Whether they actually get one is another thing, but they'll definitely be in or around this area all season, I imagine. Yeah, it's, it's the best bad run you could ask for, really, isn't it? Because they've not yeah. been 
losing games. We just haven't been winning them and scoring goals. Uh, that is a, yeah, a bit problematic because that could yeah, be that could really catch up come the end of the season. That being said, they've shown that they are they still remain a very difficult team to break down. So the the core principles that Cole Brandon instills in that team is yeah, very much there. Um, but they they need a bit of a leg up from a lot of their attackers. They've been yeah, quite 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 poor to be honest with you, other than Josh Madger. And Tom Fellows, but you know there, there's there's quality and abundance at West Brom. That's got gears to go, and I think that's the the key thing. And I think the only reason why I say that they'll finish lower, can I see them dropping out of the playoffs? You know, it might be tight between fifth and seventh, and fifth and eighth, or between fifth and eighth. So you know, if they are, it's, it's going to be it's probably going to be down to that. But I think the most likelihood thing that is going to happen is they are going to finish in the top six. So for me, the lowest that they'll probably drop is is, is six. But as you said. They are consistent. They're a hard team to beat, and um, Carlos Colburn's probably one of the best managers um, in the in the league. So you know it's really hard to see them not being a promotion contender this season. Well, they have been in a poor run of form, but hopefully they are starting to turn a corner because not only has West Brom's form dip in form been far from ideal, they've also been quite boring, haven't they? Four nil nils in seven games isn't great viewing, and. As you were alluding to, West Brom's problem is quite obvious. It's scoring goals. Only Burnley and Sheffield United have conceded fewer goals than them. Um, Despite West Brom having a big injury crisis at the back recently, they've still been really solid, haven't they? But 16 goals in 15 games is far from prolific. Josh Madger really needs some help in front of goal (laughs) because, first of all, he's got nine. And that's a big portion of their goals for one man to have. But also... Is he going to keep scoring at this rate all season? Who really knows? Um, you, you've really got to look at West Brom's attacking midfielders. Mikey Johnston, Jed Wallace, John Swift, Grady Dean Garner have no goals and one assist between them, which is quite remarkable, really. But I would assume that will improve in time. And so that's why I would be surprised if West Brom weren't in or around the playoffs come May, because... If this is where they are with one win in nine, Justin, then they should be batting around there when their form improves, really, shouldn't they? Well, this is why I said it's the best bad run they could probably hope, probably hope for because there's um, there's, a, there's there's players that need to step up. You've mentioned all of those players, like of Dred Wallace, Grady Dean Garner, who we know can deliver at this level, and we know Carlos Corbin has allowed them to deliver at this level. You know, Grady Dean Garner has played his best football in years under Carlos Corbin. Um, so I don't, you know, it's quite hard to put your finger on what's going wrong with those players. But you know, once they find their feet and find their gears, yeah, you know, there's a lot of you know, kind of attacking quality. When I mean, you've got a team who are very difficult to break down, and and despite his poor run of form, have been keeping a lot of clean sheets. That's a very healthy blend to have. But it's just whether or not those players do get going. Because if they don't, then yeah, you know, West Brom might well drop out of the playoffs. But if they do, yeah, who knows? It could be interesting. There you go, ladies and gents. This is us been playing higher and lower with every team in the championship. We hope you enjoyed it. It's been a lot of fun on our behalf over these two episodes. But patron subscribers, make sure you don't go anywhere because we've got the extended edition of the weekend show coming up, which we like to call Zamora Time. We'll be doing a Patreon Q and A, including answering the big questions like, is there a club that just and I feel more attached to as a result of us talking about them each week? And who will win in a fight, Mick McCarthy or Neil Warnock? If you're not a Patreon subscriber, sign up to get some more time every single Sunday. Head over to patreon.com forward slash second tier. Link is in the description of this episode. But that's just about it for us here on the Second Tier Podcast today. We'll be back again on Thursday to talk about any news that's happened over the past week while uh, we've been doing this higher or lower remark malarkey in the championship. So we look forward to seeing you then for that. But this has been the Second Tier Podcast. I've been Ryan Dilks. I've been Justin Peach. And a big thank you for listening. Listening.